Let's create a URL shortener. This is basically system design 101. I hope it is useful. So we put in a long URL and we get out a short URL. So first question to ask, should the short URL expire? Let's assume it should live for 100 years, which is kind of a round number we can think of as basically forever. Can the user create their own custom URL or will it be automatically generated by the server? Let's let the user create their own, but restrict the length to say 16 characters. We'll come back later to how we might treat custom URLs later in the video. How many shorten requests should we expect per month? Let's throw out a large scale number, something like 100 million shorten requests per month. Okay, so what are some of the functional requirements of this system? We want to shorten a URL. Clicking on the short URL should redirect to the long URL. The short link should be as small as possible. Let's say, let's restrict it to seven characters. The user can create a custom short URL with a max length of 16 characters. And the short link should stay in the system for 100 years. So how about some non-functional requirements? Our service should be up and running all the time. URL redirection should always be fast, even if there's a lot of traffic. And the service should expose some REST APIs this way. If a user wants to, for example, create their own app, which uses our URL shortener in some way, they can totally do that. For example, maybe they want to create a website that scrapes Wikipedia pages and generates a list of short URLs of all of the linked sources in the article. I don't know, something like that. Sky's the limit. So let's talk about facts and figures. We can expect about a roughly 200 to 1 read to write ratio. So for every one short URL which is created in the system, we should roughly expect 200 lookups of existing short URLs in the system. If we anticipate about 100 million short URLs generated per month, this means users will create 40 new short URLs every second. In a 200 to 1 ratio, this means that we should expect to have about 8,000 reads or redirects per second. If we store each short link for 100 years and create 100 million new ones each month, we should expect the total amount of objects in the system to be 120 billion. That's 120 billion of these objects. If the size of each object is 500 bytes, that means the total amount of storage we'll require is 60 terabytes. We'll get about 700 million read requests per day. Let's assume that 80% of the requests are for 20% of the data. Why? Good question. We can imagine that 20% of these short links are just more popular for one reason or another. Uh, maybe they're created by influencers with huge followings. Maybe they're, you know, shared on some popular documentation or blog that a lot of people are reading. So to cache 20% of these requests, we'll need 70 gigs of memory. So some back of the envelope calculations. If you're not familiar with this term, back of the envelope, this just means like rough estimates. 40 URLs generated per second, 120 billion short URLs generated in 100 years, 8,000 URL reads per second, and storage we'll need for 100 years will be 60 terabytes, and cache memory we'll need is 70 gigs. So this is roughly what we're working with so far. We've got a process for creating shortened URLs and a process for looking up short URLs. And make a note that this doesn't describe any error scenarios. And aside from that, there are a few other problems with the diagram. Let's talk about them. So having only one web server is a single point of failure. The system as it is right now is not very scalable. And one single database might very well not be enough for 60 terabytes of storage or 8,000 reads per second. And there are a few things we can do to fix these issues. We can add a load balancer in front of the web server, and we can also increase the amount of replicas of the web server. We can shard the database to handle huge amounts of object data, and we can add a cache system to reduce the load on the database. And we'll talk about all of these solutions more in depth in just a minute. And don't worry too much about this diagram for now, we'll come back to it piece by piece. So for now, let's talk about adding some REST endpoints to give the end user access to all of the various functionality that we need. So we're going to want an endpoint for creating a new URL. This will be a post to slash create, and we can configure it so the front end passes in a long URL and an API key and optionally a custom URL. So we'll send the long URL and the custom URL in the request body, the API key, 
can be passed in via a header or a cookie, and we'll get back either the shortened URL or some kind of error. Now we'll also want an endpoint for when someone actually clicks one of these shortened URLs. This will be a get to the shortened URL. In the body, we'll send the short URL. We'll also pass in the API key. This will either redirect to the original long URL or send back some kind of error. Now let's talk a bit about the database schema. So here's the data that we'll need to store related to a user. We have ID, name, email, and a creation date. And here is the data that we'll need to store related to a short link. So we have the short URL, the long URL, the user ID of the user that created that uh, URL, and the creation date of that link. So let's briefly talk about what the server needs to actually do to shorten a URL. Now remember, it's important that the URL generation service spits out a short URL, which is always unique, and that no two short URLs can ever point to the same long URL. So we can accomplish this in a couple of different ways. We can use a URL encoding solution like Base62 or a key generation service to accomplish this. Uh, there are some security concerns with certain techniques. For example, using MD5 can expose you to something called a collision attack. Um, so in general, it's often best to just use the built-in URL encoding functions provided by your programming language or framework. Best practices for this sort of thing are constantly changing as security practices are changing and getting better. So if you're actually doing this sort of thing for an enterprise level solution application, it's a good idea to you know thoroughly research what's the current consensus on best practices. So a few important things to keep in mind when we're working on our shortening algorithm. We need to store a lot of short links, 120 billion short links. So we're gonna accomplish this with some careful considerations around our database architecture, which we'll talk about in just a minute. The short URL, should be as short as possible, no more than seven characters. Why seven characters? I'm gonna link an article that goes into more depth about the math around this, but for now, just trust me, this is the minimum necessary to, given all the possible combinations of all alphanumerical characters, to sufficiently accommodate our expected traffic. The application should be resilient to load spikes for both URL generation and redirections, and we can handle this using some creative load distribution. We'll talk about this more in just a minute. And following a short link should be fast. So let's go back to our original diagram for a moment. A single web server is a single point of failure. If this server fails for some reason, the whole service fails. So if you've ever heard of a DDoS attack, um, distributed denial of service, this is basically the intention. Uh, you know, a malicious actor will flood your system or service with more requests than that service is capable of handling, causing the service to fall over, you get an outage, you have uh, downtime where the service is just completely available, uh, unavailable to the end user. So we can handle this by adding server redundancy, but we shouldn't just use one web server and keep the rest as backups. Let's ease the traffic load by using a load balancer to evenly distribute requests across all servers. Now, there's still an issue with database storage. So if we opt for a relational database, it'll be efficient to check if a URL exists in the database and handle concurrent writes. However, this will be more difficult to scale. In comparison, a NoSQL database will be easier to scale, but NoSQL is eventually consistent, meaning that if you perform a write to the database, that change isn't guaranteed to immediately propagate to all other parts of the system. So there is a possibility in a NoSQL service that a read immediately following a write could return stale information. In contrast, relational databases have what's called ACID compliance, which means that a database update will either get fully um, committed or fully rolled back. So these are some of kind of the, the, the what ifs that we contend with. In software, we have this common saying, uh, the best answer to any question is it depends. You know, we're always weighing the pros and cons of each solution. So a few reasons why in this particular system, a NoSQL database might be slightly better for this use case. The service requires a huge storage size, 60 terabytes, and a high amount of reads and writes, 8,000 URL reads per second, 40 URL writes per second. So we could scale with a relational database using custom partitioning and replication, but it's, it's more difficult to develop and maintain in general. In contrast, these features are available by default in NoSQL solutions like Mongo and Cassandra. Ideally, we will want to distribute data across multiple machines using shards, 
This is a feature which comes out of the box using something like Mongo or Cassandra. So when we've generated a seven character short URL and then use the hash as a shard key, and basically all this means is that we're using the hashed version of the URL to determine which bucket it will live in. So first we hash the URL and that hash becomes the key and our database will automatically decide which bucket the URL will go into. Then when we need to look up that information, the database knows which bucket to look into based on the hash. So let's take a bit of a step back. If we had originally opted for using a key generation service instead of a hashing strategy to generate the short URL, we would want to have a dedicated database to store already generated random seven character strings. And whenever we want to use one of these seven character strings for a new URL, we would go into that database and mark that entry as used. Ultimately, it'll be a little bit more complicated than this uh, to get a solution with no single points of failure or concurrency issues, but that this is kind of the gist of it. Let's talk about caching. There will inevitably be certain short URLs which are more frequently accessed than others. Let's say Mr. Beast makes a link to his merch store and shares it to his 200 million subscribers. So more people are going to use his link than most of the other links generated in our service. So let's make sure that our system gives priority to a link like that as far as how fast it will take to perform a read. So when we do a read, we take the short URL and look in our system for that short URL entry. We take its accompanying long URL and we redirect the user to the long URL. Now with these hottest links, the links shared by celebrities and popular accounts, uh, we want to make sure that they're more quickly available than normal. The system shouldn't have to go all the way into the database to find them. So before going all the way into the database, our application servers can much more quickly serve it up if it exists in some kind of a cache. So we can use an off the shelf solution like memcached or Redis, which can store an object containing the long and short URL. And using the Pareto principle, let's cache 20% of daily traffic, since we can reasonably guess that 80% of the clicks to links in our system will be clicks on about 20% of the links. And as we said before, we need 70 gigs of memory to cache 20% of traffic. And since a modern day enterprise level server can have about 64 to 250 gigabytes of memory, we'll need one or two. Of course, it's a good idea to add redundancy here anyway, just in case we need a backup or if we want to distribute some of the hottest URLs between multiple machines, let's say Mr. Beast merch link on machine one and Bad Bunny's OnlyFans on machine two. So what if the cache fills up? Pretty reasonable policy is least recently used where we use something like a linked hash map to store our URLs by hash, which will keep track of which ones have been most and which ones have been least recently used. So how does a linked hash map work? It's similar to a regular hash map where it uses a hash table for quick access to elements based on their keys. This provides O of one constant time lookup, but it also uses a linked list to maintain the order of elements. So it preserves the order in which the elements were inserted or accessed. But this video isn't really about specific data structures, so I'm not gonna go super deep into that. Now, there's a possibility of a cache miss happening. This is when the data that is requested is not in the cache, so the servers have to go look into the database. And when this happens, we take the data retrieved from the database and use it to update the cache and pass the new entry to all of the cache replicas. And now let's talk briefly about load balancers. There are three places in our system where a load balancer could be added between the client and the application servers, between the app servers and the database servers, and between the app servers and the cache servers. So in each case, the load balancer is processing incoming requests to either generate URLs or look them up. And the load balancer could evenly distribute requests among all available services or give special priority to certain machines in certain scenarios. So initially, we could use a round robin strategy to distribute requests evenly among all available servers. This is useful as a starting point because in theory, distributed evenly between four servers, each server would handle 25% of traffic in theory. But what happens in this scenario where for any number of possible reasons, one of these servers becomes overloaded or slow. So we can implement some kind of health check, which queries the servers and adjusts load distributions based on that. 
And special consideration for certain unique scenarios can be given as well. For example, like I mentioned earlier, we probably don't want all of our hot links accidentally ending up on the same cache server. So going back to the very beginning of this exercise, when the customer wants to create their own custom short URL. In other words, if we have a system which is automatically generating thousands upon thousands of seven character random URLs, how do we make sure that we can give these customers the most freedom to choose whatever URL they want with the least likelihood that their custom URL will conflict with one of the random ones the system has already generated? So one simple way to get around this is to just require that any custom URLs be at least eight characters. In addition, if we wanted to give these custom URLs some kind of special preferential treatment, let's say in the scenario that the service uh, for you know, creating custom URLs is a paid service, we could have a dedicated database instance just for these custom URLs, as well as dedicated web servers. Thanks for watching. This video was largely inspired by Sandeep Verma's article on the topic, which I'll link in the description below. If you feel like taking a slightly deeper dive, especially when it comes to some math and the specifics of how the URL generation algorithm might work. I, I think it's well worth your time to give it a read. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.